Hi, Maria. Can you hear me? Hi, Maria. Can you hear me okay? Uh, uh, my name is Susan Abbott and I'm with Counterpart International. And today we are very delighted to uh, welcome you to our session for the Global Democracy Coalition Forum on Can Social Accountability Rebuild Democracy from the Ground Up? Um, I'm very pleased to be doing this today um, very much in the spirit of collaboration and partnership. Um, our session kind of came together in a very serendipitous way. Um, we are joined today with a wonderful lineup of panelists and respondents. Um, and I'll turn to um, each of them to quickly introduce themselves and where they're working. And then we will launch right in to our discussion. Our session today is um, co-organized by Counterpart and the Accountability Research Center um, at American University. And also wanted to give a big thanks to Nick Benequista at the Center for International Media Assistance, um, who's one of our respondents for also helping to put this together. So without further ado, um, I'm going to uh, just let you know that we're going to ask you to please put your questions and comments in the chat box. We hope to have a really fruitful chat. Feel free to introduce yourselves. Um, we're gonna go through our kind of run of show or our program um, and key discussion questions and then work towards um, a Q and A at the very end. Um, and also to collect from folks any ideas that they might have um, for uh, a year of action that we can you know, talk more about um, as we proceed along. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to um, Naomi and then uh, the other speakers just to quickly introduce themselves. Thanks so much, Susan. I'm Naomi Hussain. I work at the Accountability Research Center that has co-organized this with Susan. It's great to see so many of you here and some people I know and some names that I know. So I'm really thrilled. Looking forward. Great. Christian? Hi, I'm Christian Aranda. I work at uh, Counterpart International as Senior Governance Advisor, and I work mostly in the Middle East, North Africa and West Africa. Uh, on local governance and accountability issues. Thanks, excited for this discussion. Great, Ahi. Hi everyone, my name is Ahi Dako. I work with Accountability Lab Nigeria as the program I'm learning manager and excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, my name is Andrew Lavali. I work in early man. I'm the executive director for the Institute for Governance Reform. We just established eight years ago um, out of a need to bridge the gap between um, the knowledge and policy. Um, it's social accountability is, is quite a, an experiment that we have been doing. Um, we happen to be the, one of the grantees of the GPSC. It's, I'm happy to be here to share our experience. Thank you. And we have Maria. Hi, thank you, Susan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I am Maria Barón. I'm from Argentina, and I head an organization called Directorio Legislativo. And for uh, a week or so more, I am the co-chair of the Steering Committee of OGP together with the government of Korea. Thank you. Great. And we have two respondents, Nick. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nick Benequista, and I'm the Senior Director at the Center for International Media Assistance, which is a small research and learning unit focused on media development issues. And SEMA is situated at the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, which is a congressionally funded NGO that supports uh, journalists and human rights activists and uh, other proponents of uh, and supporters of democracy around the world. Thanks. Wonderful. And finally, uh, Craig Hammer. Craig? Thanks, Susan. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Craig Hammer. I'm a program manager uh, in the development data group at the World Bank. Uh, 
And it's great to see some familiar faces and names here. So I'm looking forward to today. Super. So without further ado, I just wanted to say that today's panel will address what kinds of social accountability efforts can lead to democratic practice and accountability. We'll have a chance to hear from all of these wonderful panelists and respondents um, to hear more about what they're seeing in terms of the work on the ground and how social accountability is rebuilding democracy. Um, we want to hear from the panelists and also from all of you. Uh, so feel free to um, put any comments. Oh, excuse me, you're frozen. I'm frozen. You can't hear me now? No, you're oh. back now. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, we want to hear from everyone in the chat, and we'll have some time at the end as well to hear about examples of the work that you're doing in terms of how social accountability is contributing to democracy strengthening. Um, we take a broad view of social accountability as a collective or organized um, citizens' efforts to hold governments or transition transnational corporations and organizations to increase transparency about what they do and find um, in terms of how we can hold them accountable. So for people joining, um, please do put your questions and comments in the chat. And if you have specific recommendations or things that you would like to see happen um, in this social accountability space, we would love to hear from you. So to our panelists, on the one hand, we're hearing about democracy being on the decline and that we're in an era of closing civic space or changing civic space. On the other hand, we hear about a number of citizen-led efforts that are promoting change. Can you share some examples of what you're seeing in terms of citizen-led efforts that contribute to transparency and accountability on the ground? Uh, what citizen-led efforts can you cite that are contributing to democracy? Um, each panelist will have five minutes and uh, we'll just go in order starting with Naomi. Hey, thank you so much, Susan. And you know, there's, there's several very esteemed social accountability experts on this call. Um, I'm looking at you, Florencia and Tom Aston. So I, uh, you know, I'm a bit nervous about how we use the terminology. Hope you'll be forgiving us. But one reason I really wanted to have to, for, for, for a counterpart and uh, accountability research center to host this discussion was, I think we have a tendency to think about social accountability as you know, report cards and citizen scorecards and citizen monitoring and that kind of initiative. And we think about those as all about making public services better, uh, about more responsive to people's feedback and, and delivering better services. And I think it's really important getting citizens what they need is in my mind at least, very much a part of democracy. You know, democracy is not just about civil and political rights, it's also about social and economic rights. You know, Or democracy should be about all of those things. I think we haven't often thought about it in that way. But I think also when it comes to social accountability, it's the act of holding governments and also the private sector, let's leave that aside for now, but the act of holding governments accountable is, is itself an act of democracy. And when, you know, in our work in the Accountability Research Center, our, our, our main emphasis really is that we want to learn with the activists and the, the, the reformers who are on the ground trying to make change on account, trying to make governments more transparent and, and accountable. And learning, talking to these people, learning with these people, I think what we learn is that the experience of being involved in, in trying to hold government accountable, trying to monitor what's going on, trying to make more transparent what, what is actually happening in terms of policy and programs. That very experience is very empowering. People uh, find that it demystifies government to some extent. You know, before you've had any experience of engaging with government, you really don't know what to expect. It's demystifying, it's a way of finding out who the people are you need to engage with to get some change. Um, learning very much, this is very important to us, the Accountability Research Center, learning how to come together to engage in, in useful and constructive ways with government officials and so that so that those demands become unignorable. So just doing social accountability, regardless, in fact, of, of whether it actually makes better public services is itself uh, a way of, of enriching, invigorating democracy from the bottom up. But I think that one of the things that we're learning, you know, one of the examples that we see is that it's not enough um, for citizens to be able to make those claims, to demand change. 
it, it also it also is necessary for governments to be able to respond effectively. They need to have the capacities, they need to have the willingness, the desire to respond to what citizens want. And so I think it's really important that even if civics, even if civic space is closing at the national level, there are good reasons, I think, to believe that social accountability is working to, to, to build democracy subnationally or locally. But it's not enough, I think, for people to have a voice. It's not enough for people to shout. We know for sure that all of the protests that we've seen in the last two, three years in particular have really not led to accountability. They've just really got people in some ways more frustrated, I think, than anything. So governments need to be able to respond. And, and they want, many of them we see, want to respond. They want to create space for citizens. And that's true whether or not they, they are governments that have been freely and fairly elected through a multi-party electoral system. Most governments want to be able to do better because that is where they get the legitimacy from with their, with their citizens. I think we see a lot, I think one of the best examples in our work is from our partners in, in the Philippines, Government Watch, which has been mobilizing networks of volunteers to monitor the pandemic policy responses, you know, whether it's vaccines or social protection schemes. And those, and those, those teams of volunteers came together on the experience of having monitored other public services in the past. And now what they're doing is they're turning all of this capacity, all of this networking into what they're calling making elections an accountability platform, creating spaces for citizens to discuss and evaluate really at the very grassroots level what the government has been doing in terms of protect, protecting citizens during the pandemic. So I feel, I feel quite optimistic that almost definitionally it is true that social accountability can, can build democracy from the bottom up. But it's not something that we sitting in cities like Washington DC and London and other places actually often notice. So this is one of the reasons I wanted to have this discussion with this interesting group of people. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, over to you, Christian. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, I, I think I, what I'm going to say kind of bears nicely on, on what Naomi just just said, I mean, the question is about uh, um, movements that we citizen led efforts that contribute to transparency and accountability. And I think there are many, many, some are very well known, some are not quite as well known that are taking place uh, all across uh, the world and, and in the regions that I know best, uh, Middle East and North Africa and Burkina Faso and Niger uh, and West Africa in general. Uh, that we, we, we've seen many of those uh, start, uh, if, if we look back, uh, for example, at the Tunisian revolution, it all started really about demanding accountability, uh, dignity, basic dignity, the fact that uh, um, a street vendor put himself on fire to demand a, a right to uh, uh, being a, seen as a person in the eye of, of government, really of local authorities. I think this is a very a strong act of demanding accountability and this, is, uh, this started a democratic revolution uh, in the country. We've seen similar movements in um, Burkina Faso uh, with Le, Le Ballet Citoyen, which literally means uh, the citizen broom, which I love the image of uh, uh, citizens just kind of cleaning up uh, the corruption and demanding more, more responsiveness, uh, or the Yonamar movement in, in Senegal. Uh, those all start, there is a demand for greater democracy, but really it's often phrased, termed in terms of uh, a demand for more responsiveness, a demand for um, being more accountable to citizens and treating citizens with, uh, with the basic dignity that they deserve. So I think from that perspective, the um, democracy building and, and building accountability are really very much uh, intertwined and, and uh, mutually dependent. Um, we maybe more on the grassroots level in terms of the type of efforts that we've been able to see uh, with counterpart, we, we have been now working in Niger for a very long time. And I think we, we, have, we have helped facilitate and emerge a, a grassroots movement that is really uh, taking root right now uh, in the country that went from small citizen um, monitoring committees that were just created really to start overseeing the performance of not even the performance of government, actually, it was uh, making sure that action plans that were decided as a result of multi stakeholder dialogues, uh, that they were implemented. And those little by little took a bigger role. Um, and they started to organize themselves to be 
uh, intermediaries between government and, uh, and, and citizens. Uh, they wanted to reach out down to the villages, so we supported them in that. Uh, we saw the other municipalities create or help uh, create similar uh, committees, and then the uh, committees were created at the regional level, then at the national level, and very soon now the situation is we have a national network of those committees that work together and collaborate. Uh, we played a role in this, so it wasn't purely uh, emerging from the grassroots, but I, I, uh, for the, the greatest part, it was really citizen-led, and, and it is something that's there to stay uh, because it was locally led. So um, I think we see those, those movements uh, everywhere, and they always have some underlying democratic uh, demand behind them. Uh, sometimes they lead to revolutions, and sometimes they're, they're more discreet and just work on, on in the background and in, in building some of those foundations for more accountability and democracy. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, now going over to Ahi in Nigeria, tell us about your views on these same issues. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. Um, well, accountability, transparency, participation, inclusion, they've all become like guiding features or principles of democracy. But um, even though Nigeria's democracy is currently like a train wreck with all manners of um, heightened voters apathy, clamp down on fundamental human rights of citizens, a weakened relationship between those who govern and the governed, um, so to, rest, to restore a sense of semblance, there have been a lot of citizens-led efforts on ground. I think at a broader level, I'd like to highlight um, the NSAS protest. That was the movement led by young Nigerians in all six geopolitical zones to, um, to end the police intimidation, oppression, and um, brutality. And that effort was kind of successful because at least the government yielded to some of the demands, which I think um, they were able to hold the government accountable. And then at the community level, for us at Accountability Lab, we, are, we have been implementing a citizens-led um, project, which we call the Civic Action Teams, and which is basically um, a feedback, dialogue, and community voice platform to ensure accountability in development, in the development process, and also to increase um, meaningful participation and strengthening the voice of young people, women, and persons with disability in governance. And truly, we've been doing that through community members, through community frontline associates, that's what we call them. And we've experienced a level of change that I think has contributed largely to what we experienced. Um, the whole democratic process in Nigeria, we for, for one, we've been seeing community members um, come together to um, influence the enactment of of a disability community members and elected representatives strengthened during periodic town hall elections where where um, community challenges are being discussed and solutions are being preferred by elected representatives. And then community members are now becoming more interested and more aware of um, governance related issues and are beginning to ask critical questions on budgetary allocations, on expenditure, marginalized voices in the community are gradually being included in um, decision making processes. Um, another citizens-led effort I can reference to is um, a project called Tracker. I think is implemented by one of the um, one of the CSOs in Nigeria called Budget. What is usual is a, is a, is a citizens-led effort also, which um, community of implementation of government projects in their communities to ensure service delivery. Citizens, what happens usually is that citizens post ongoing projects in their communities on a platform and they provide updates on them. And um, members of the community use that as an advocacy tool to hold leaders and all government agencies accountable. So democracy is people-centered and basically most of the most of the citizens-led 
efforts on ground are immensely contributing to democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Uh, I think all of the presentations uh, fit nicely with what the, the thoughts I'm going to share. Um, at the Institute for Governance Reform, you, you know, we have a very small uh, policy research and advocacy outfits based here. Um, so in, in line with what other people have said, you see, democracy thrives in the context of trust. Um, trust, that critical trust between duty bearers and right holders. When that trust is missing, I, too often we see anarchy, um, contestation not necessarily relates, uh, translating into improved um, lives of citizens. And what we do in social accountability is to see how do we you know, build trust bonds and reciprocity between citizens and, and duty bearers. So at the center for, of, of all of that um, is, is the feedback loop between citizens and, and duty bearers. So in Sierra Leone, uh, mindful of the fact that social accountability is normally context driven, uh, what we normally do at IGR, we invest in understanding the context, understanding the political economy issues, and that informs our, our activities. So I'll just share just four of those things that normally drive our thinking in designing our social accountability at intervention. One, we realize that Sierra Leone is a weak state. It's, it's, it's a country that from war, it's a country that is, that is poor. And in, in, in that context where citizens are very poor and the state is equally poor, it is not proper to mount huge expectation on this that the state cannot meet. So definitely the country will have a possibility of sliding back uh, through interventions of NGOs. Um, so, so, so again, like in many African countries, uh, Sierra Leone is again ethnically divided. So you can draw the map of Sierra Leone. You see the, 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 the Northern region, which is almost half of the country becoming red, that is opposition areas. And then the, the South and Eastern region becoming green, which is the ruling party areas. So if, if we have societies that are ethnically divided, there is, there is always a tendency for populism, for political parties to, you know, to drive you know, populist agenda, identity-based politics, which is not only typical of Sierra Leone, but it's common across Africa. The third, the third thing we, we always take note of is citizens are far removed from decision-making. A, num a number of people who work with in rural communities do not care how many people are in the president's delegation to New York, uh, or what is what did the Minister of Finance an announce in the budget in parliament. So what they are concerned about is about their microcredits, whether they get nurse in, nurses in hospitals, whether their teachers are in, 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 in school. And the fourth one is which has been normally the difficulties what are the incentives for change in all of this, you know, this complex mind, political minefield? How do you drive change in all of this? So for us, we, there are a number of examples that we can share. We've done the Citizens Manifesto with, where we mobilized 700 groups across Sierra Leone. It's about quite the biggest coalition in the last elections to, 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 to bring citizens agenda on the elections agenda. Um, we, we did the ending bribery for traffic offenses, which was a research done where we just identified patterns of payment of bribes to police officers, and we published that and we engaged authorities in how do we stop bribery for traffic offenses. But what I will share with you in a couple of minutes is the work we're doing with the, the Global Partnership for Social Accountability, which is a service delivery index. With the GPSC, we've done what we call the SDI, focusing on health and education outcomes. Um, so bearing in mind those, the conditions, the context I've just painted, we, one of the things we're thinking about, we, we thought about how can the issue of education, local authorities, uh, citizens in general, how can they own the initiative of delivering essential services? So the first, we, we, the, the way we, gone, we went about that is ensuring that we had a buy-in of the ministry in designing the tools, in 
first and foremost, depending on what the indicators should be. The second one is too often, you know, people take parliament out of social accountability because I see in many social accountability literatures, there's an emphasis on decentralized service providers and policymakers, um, normally the MDAs in capitals. But we decided to, to factor in parliament because out of the idea that parliament is killing that we, you know, if there's a partnership between citizens and parliament, there will be a greater demand for service delivery on the ground. So we, we and again, given the fact that parliamentary turnover in Sierra Leone is about 82%. So the incentive we introduced in the project was that, you know, citizens, parliamentarians are losing their seats because uh, service delivery is poor. So they bought into that and we did the, the service delivery index for MP constituencies and local councils. So the research actually looked at the delivery of services in all 132 MP constituencies and local councils, selecting five schools randomly in every constituency uh, and two health centers in every con constituency. So on the basis of that, we rank the schools and the health centers. Incredible, I know time is running out, but uh, one of the things we did uh, after the result was out for the first time, the result was launched in parliament just because we ensured that there is there was buying of members of parliament. It is not, we did not promote a terrain of contestation, but we tried to promote cooperation between, between us and them. So they bought in and this week, uh, the service delivery, which is the first civil society report to be debated in parliament will be debated in parliament. And the Minister of Health and Education actually co-authored the forward of the document, which gave, gave us authority uh, to share the, the, the results at the community level. We've just completed a roadshow in the, the, the districts that are the poorest, um, because they meet the two ministers of education and health agreed that starts rebuilding citizen state engagement in districts that are hard to reach that are the poorest. So uh, things like teacher deployment, things like uh, how nurses are being uh, allocated to, 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 to clinics, the tests of drugs, we are all discussed in a more educated atmosphere and that was devoid of rancor because all of them we are part of the project and they realized that um, they, they, the best way to go is, 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 is to accept the change. I, I will end with, with, with a quote from one of the chiefs. Uh, there is a particular chief in Sierra Leone. Chiefs are very powerful here. So a chief normally runs, is the traditional leader of a geographic area. So there's a chief in, in the district, in the chiefdom, that could say that's one of the poorest places to live on the planet. And this chief said, after we presented the service delivery index, we told them we are giving bad news to your community. But at the end of the day, if you work together, that is citizens and duty bearers, there's a possibility for you to convert this liability into an asset. And then the chief said, bingo, the next time you're here, this result will change in both health and education. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking much of your time. No, it's wonderful. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, rounding out our kind of opening statements, um, we have Maria on the line here from Argentina. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Susan, and thanks for all the, the interesting uh, projects that you commented before me. I wanted to, to, to comment on our project, but first, before that, at least in the context that I'm living at, which is Latin America, the whole hemisphere, from Mexico down to the south, there are um, groups and organizations that uh, only by um, uh, keeping themselves alive, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a miracle during 2021. So just maybe they don't have the specific initiatives that are so creative and successful that we can tell, but only by existing, uh, they're being harassed and surveilled by the different governments, especially in the North uh, or in the Northern Triangle and some uh, of the parts of uh, Central America. So just to acknowledge 
that the existence of some groups and organizations, it's a miracle in itself. But uh, today I wanted to share uh, um, an initiative that has been uh, for some years now happening in Argentina. And since I am from Argentina, I always make the case of not only um, sharing examples from my own country, but this one I think is really, really relevant and we don't have the time to share others. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and share that one with you. And it's called I'm not sure if you heard of this part of the initiative, but of the corruption scandal, I'm sure you have. This, this initiative is called Clean Form, or in Spanish, it's called Ficha Limpia, which is a response to um, corruption scandal, scandal, like I said, I'm sure you've heard, which is the notebook scandal, which is just to share a, a, a brief a, a summary of what happened. It's a chauffeur of a vice minister in the previous government in Argentina that during five years or four years, he, with a notebook, he recorded everything that he did while uh, being the chauffeur of this vice minister. So all the meetings that he attended, all the addresses, all the people that he carried in the car besides the minister, and all that is recorded in, in writing in six notebooks. And so in those notebooks, the, uh, he, he um, gave those six notebooks to a friend uh, you know, and in a cardboard box, and that friend took it to the to a friend that's a lawyer and that uh, or a journalist, and that journalist shared it with um, the district attorney in Argentina. And so, in those, the data that is in those notebooks resulted in forty-two people detained, half more or less half public officials and other half businessmen, uh, men. <laughs> Uh, not business women as well. And so this, just to share, and you, you can Google it, notebook scandal or uh, escandalo de los cuadernos in Spanish, but it was covered by all the, all the media. And so this initiative as a response to that, or as one of the responses to that big, big scandal, because it it meant like for a year, all these business people and, and, and very high level ministers and public officials going to the courts and that covered by all the media, it was very high uh, or, or really covered by the media. Um, so this person, um, another, uh, a person called uh, Gaston Marra, a citizen, a normal citizen by, by the feet, we call it in Spanish, de a pie. Uh, he decided that he wanted, uh, that it was a good initiative, to create a bills that could prevent people that were sentenced uh, uh, for corruption in, in, in counts uh, to, uh, for being um, lawmakers. So this, he, he put it in the form of a bill. And so the idea is that people that have been sentenced to corruption uh, counts cannot be candidates. And so he initiated very timidly at the beginning and, uh, and, and very strongly now uh, this initiative getting uh, you know some journalists some champions at the and mostly at the local level or as we say subnational because it's uh, Argentina's a federal system so you have all the provinces and then you have like all the municipalities he did it at the provincial level not the federal one and so he found many champions many journalists that wanted to help and of course many organizations like mine that wanted to join this as he calls citizen movement. And when I told him, for example, that I was going to talk about this today, he said, please don't mention my name, which I already did, uh, because he wants to, to everyone to understand that this is a citizen movement and it's not led by anyone, although every citizen movement has a couple of leaders at least. And this um, movement, as he calls it, doesn't have a, a registration. It's not a, an NGO or a foundation. And the only thing that they have is the social networks. 
and so Twitter mostly and Facebook and also uh, all the petitions uh, through change. So what he did, where we are right now is three laws have been passed at the subnational level. So in those provinces, none of the people that already have corruption, corruption sentences can present themselves as candidates. Uh, we believe that before the year, year ends, we will have a fourth one. But I think if we can, and, and I really briefed the whole interesting initiative, but if I have to say two or three things of the criteria that they, or that we all agreed in this sort of initiative or, or movement, uh, the first one is uh, it's non-political. So there's been thousands, thousands, thousands literally of Zoom conversations, public, private, but uh, if there was a politician, we needed to have politicians from mostly all of the parties or not politicians that you knew that were going to sort of bring um, sort of the, the whole initiative to uh, sort of more, more partisan lens. Uh, so it, it's very clear that it's, it's a citizen thing, not a political thing. The, the second one, like I said before, they want to call it citizen movement because after this, um, there's other initiatives which I'm going to, so this derived in sort of an internal conversation and there's another, there's other needs that the sort of group sees and I'm going to tell you now and then the third is there's no money so no one has funding for this so they only use what they have so everyone has other jobs I work for an organization he has the person that leads this has a radio program and he's a lawyer and everyone has other uh, sort of metier and then just to finish with this and we can exchange after this. It's really, really interesting because it's ongoing and maybe next year we talk about this and there's other uh, sort of unexpected results or expected ones. And um, I, would, I would like to say sort of the, the next steps or the things that have um, uh, been uh, sort of at the core of the internal debate of this movement. The first one is um, the idea that we need uh, with more whistleblowers to bring in uh, sort of like uh, of this chauffeur, which was uh, sort of a chance that, uh, you know, all the dots got joined in some, for some reason. And so we need more uh, whistleblowers. But then, of course, if we need more whistleblowers, we need the protection of them. And so we're creating sort of a group that can create a, or advocate for the protection of, of uh, whistleblowers in different ways. The, the second one is there are already several multi-stakeholder champions. So there are, I would say, a mini, a mini cohort of MPs at the subnational level that already champion this by themselves. And that's the interesting, interesting thing of the movements, I think, which is, then you lose control or you lose contact and they can advocate uh, for this or other issues. Okay. And Maria, then- We need to wrap up just quickly here. This is a wonderful, just, would, wonderful example and I think- Thank you. Inspiring <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, but maybe kind of now to, to you, Maria and to the rest of the panel, can you maybe comment a little bit on uh, how do organizations who seek to build social accountability better make use of what we've learned in terms of what works and what doesn't? So you've already given some kind of really good cues on that, Maria, but could some other panelists kind of weigh in here on lessons learned or perhaps some of the evaluation specialists and researchers that we have joining us? Maybe you have thoughts that you could put into the chat, but you know, what are our lessons learned? What's working? What's not working? Uh, starting with you, Naomi, please. Yeah, I, I, I want to very much want to hear from the uh, the other participants here. So I won't, don't want to go on for ages, but I think that one of the things we have learned is that uh, if uh, if the learning agenda, the research agenda, is set, you know, far away from the actual action, if the people who are doing the activism aren't the people who uh, get to set that learning agenda, who say what's important and why it's important, then it's the learning is very limited, the learning is very detached from the reality and it's not very 
applicable. It's not actionable in the way that it might be if we're learning with um, actual frontline actors. Great, thank you. That's very provocative and simple. So very good one that we could perhaps come back to. Um, Christian, what are your lessons learned? There are very many lessons learned, of course, but uh, you know, I, I, I think we go back to what is tried and true and that we know works because we see that it works. And, and this is really emphasizing partnership, emphasizing collaboration, and speaking for counterpart, which is an outside organization, uh, of course, we are uh, we intervene from the outside in in, in local uh, local processes and, and local contexts. Uh, is, is keeping to a facilitating uh, role that we don't drive the agenda, but that will really facilitate the uh, the agenda and and really try to the greatest extent as possible to really be about locally led development, not not. Uh, development uh, pushed from the outside. Um, maybe one, one thing that I would say, uh, and I think Naomi touched on this uh, a little earlier in the first uh, uh, little uh, intervention. Um, I think it's, it's also really about approaches. I mean, we, we've, there are so many tools out there uh, that uh, can be used and they're sometimes used with great effect and sometimes not so much. And sometimes it's an outside consultant that comes in and does everything for the local community. And that is not sustainability. I think what is more important is what is the approach, the overarching approach we have with, um, with the communities. And I, I would really second that this issue of the learning uh, agenda and who does the learning, who generates the knowledge and who benefits, uses and benefits from that knowledge is also really critical. And I'm glad that Naomi mentioned that because that's something that we, tend not to think about, especially as implementers, because we, we have a, we are accountable as well to the donor and we need to learn and we need to have data and we think of them in terms of our own reporting as opposed to really how they can help empower our local communities. So that, that's, I will stop here. Great, thank you. Ahi, what are your lessons learned? Okay, um, I would just like to highlight three points. Um, well, from our work, one of the things we've learned is um, a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work at all. So when it comes to social accountability at the community level, you have to always, um, the context always matters, and you have to put that into consideration. And then um, another thing we have realized is that um, how you engage with stakeholders, um, the citizens, community members, elected representatives, how you manage and engage with them, um, it um, will, largely, will largely depend on how successful um, any organization that's trying to build social accountability turns out. So the management and engagement of the key stakeholders are very, are very important. And then lastly, um, here, um, the speaker before me already highlighted it. A lot of organizations like to compete. That doesn't work, but I think leveraging on partnership and collaboration of other organizations doing similar um, interventions um, always goes a long way. So collaboration works and competing doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, any lessons learned from your work in Sierra Leone? Yes, some, some of the points already hinted. Um, yeah, so thank you very much e, e, for the last comment just made. But I would just dovetail a little bit on the political economy issue. So when the headmaster, I mean, last week told us, you, you know, went to this community and gave them, we introduced cash books. So for them to record, uh, school fee subsidies going to the community. The government of Sierra Leone provides one one dollar per term uh, for for a child. It might be very small for you, but for those communities, it's it's very big. So if you have three hundred kids, you have three hundred dollars per term. So how to account for those funds? So at the heart of building education systems is actually building uh, you know management of education finances at the community level. 
So we have these uh, school supervisors that actually pilfer. They go to those headmasters and they take the funds which affect the management of the, 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 those, those places. So the headmasters were saying, how can I complain? Because the school, head, the school supervisor is my boss, I'll be transferred. So, so it, it's really the context that really matters that I, I really mentioned. So but I think what is very important is, is the leverage. So we've seen that to be very important because for, do, for them, for those schools that we, we champion, for those, um, Hospitals who's called champion at the national level. Because it doesn't matter how much you, you educate communities, there are many problems that community all by themselves cannot solve. They cannot employ teachers, they cannot employ nurses. So you need stronger organizations to work with weaker groups, um, as Harry mentioned, to have this broad uh, coalition. Um, so, so what they've been doing, like just last night, a headmaster called me to say my roof was uh, destroyed by a storm and the roof was su supplied to me by a disaster management agency. And the chief is not allowing us to use the roof to, to, to the zinc to roof the school. So we, we, we are alerting the anti-corruption commission to take, take uh, you know, action on that. So it's really, to me, it's about understanding context and understand trying to understand the incentives, we will never have got uh, our report debated in parliament if we never understood what members of parliament had wanted to see in our reports. And on top of that, how can they embracing social accountability can align to their political interests as well? Thank you so much. Uh, Maria, just quickly, anything you want to add to this point on that. I just part. wanted to, to underline some of the words that Christian and uh, Andrew were saying about partnerships and about how to strengthen the role of the organizations or groups that are working in, in a specific district or, or context. Because many times uh, the regional or the international organizations, organizations or groups step in and in a way without wanting many times or, or usually what they do is um, um, sort of weaken them or their role. And, uh, and we found at least in my experience this year that there's a really strategic roles for um, uh, all of the different uh, origins of organizations. If there's a sort of space and a communication that allows for partnership. I think um, the, the local conversation all the way up to the international one, I think really uh, uh, can uh, accommodate for the best objective for each uh, of the different organizations or groups that, that are there. And also one other thing is to work in a sort of multi-stakeholder uh, fashion in a way. Thank you, Jasad. Thank you so much. We're gonna open up our final question to everyone um, on, in the group and I'll, I'll kind of keep mindful of the time because I wanna make sure we go to Nick and Craig for some, um, some responses. Um, our final question is um, to the panel and to everyone on the line. Is it unrealistic to expect social accountability to help rebuild democracy? Is social accountability work inherently at odds with democracy building? Um, maybe if the panel um, could kind of give, give some examples here, or just quickly, if you could just give a yes or no in terms of is social accountability work inherently at odds with democracy building? Quick yes or no, and your reason why in one sentence. What if we ask everyone to stick it in the chat and then we, then we get to save it for later? That would be, if people want to do that, that would be lovely. And uh, Tom, feel free to ask your question here. You have a wonderful question. Heard little about international so far. Um, maybe if you could explain what your question is a little bit while people are thinking of their uh, answers. I'll type my question into the chat here. Um, but 
the, the question we are posing to the panel and to everyone on the, the line, is it unrealistic to expect social accountability to help rebuild democracy? Yes or no, with a quick one sentence reason why. Naomi, is it is it realistic? No, but it takes time. Why is that? Why no? In one sentence. You can't just fix, you can't fix these problems with an app or with a little bit of information. You need to build citizens' capacities, citizens' collective capacities. You need to figure out how to engage with the state in a way that works. All of these things take time. Great. Christian, no, but it's optimistic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think it's very clear to me that uh, you cannot have democracy without accountability and you cannot have accountability without democracy. Uh, but that one doesn't necessarily lead to the other. And, and that, that's kind of the key uh, lesson that we've seen. I mentioned Tunisia briefly uh, in my introduction. And I think if we see, look at what happened in Tunisia where you had a process of democratic, democracy building that was not responding to the needs of citizens, uh, where citizens saw a mess in parliament, people actually fighting with each other. Uh, then then you, you had a pseudo coup that took place and now nobody really knows where this is going. So and that's a perfect case of democracy happening without accountability. And at the same time, accountability uh, without democracy can only go so far. So yes, we can hope by building democracy, we can build a little bit uh, on the foundations by, by through accountability, we can build a little bit the foundations of, uh, of democracy, but we also need to be realistic in terms of how far we can go and how much we can achieve. Thank you. Ahi and uh, Andrew. To ask, oh, go sorry, ahead. can I just ask you, I don't know if the other participants are clear that we're asking you also, what do you think? Is it is it an unrealistic link to make between social accountability and democracy? That's just everyone on this call, not just the panel. Tom, did you want to join in? Sorry, I was just trying to clarify the um, my response to Maria. She didn't understand my question. Um, so I can clarify that one if that's helpful. I was just writing it in the chat. Oh, absolutely. Um, Go I, for it. I, 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 I do think it is possible, but it's part of many things. Um, you know, uh, that would be my answer to it. But um, in terms of the international point, um, I was just asking the question in relation to how important or not do you think um, those connections or linkages may be, because that's an argument that's commonly made, but it, it isn't really, I think, what's come out from the speakers. And I wonder if that's because they weren't necessarily important factors, or uh, I misheard, possibly, uh, or they were important factors, but they just weren't mentioned. Um, so I'd be just curious to hear. Um, on that. Any reactions from the panel or the audience on Tom's question? Maybe we can come back to that. Um, Andrew and Ehi, I'm very curious to hear your your reaction to the, the question of, is it unrealistic to expect social accountability to help rebuild democracy? Is social accountability work inherently at odds with democracy building? And here, for me, it's interesting because as Andrew knows, I've just come from Sierra Leone and spent a lot of time talking to local councils. So I have this very vivid picture of civil society, um, you know, in the face of councils, in the face of civil servants and politicians. And the question really is quite an interesting one in terms of, you know, does civil society in this sense of social accountability work contribute to democracy building? Is it helping to make the, the work of these local councils more democratic, more open and transparent in helping them with their work? What is what is your take on this question from your work, from your perspectives? Uh, quick yes or no, and reason why. I think, I think social accountability definitely helps build democracy. Um, so 
Susan, you, you're quite right from what is happening in Sierra Leone. I mean, for those of you on the panel and, and audience, you can just check the Citizens Manifesto, which we did in 20, 2018. I think for social accountability to build democracy, there should be some convergence between social accountability and political accountability. And if we leave them distinct, um, so you, you will see social accountability doing some form of promotion of service delivery without actually attacking the underlying constraints, uh, the binding constraint to service delivery or to, to underperformance of the states, which is really you need in democratic reforms. So what we did in, this, in the Citizens Manifesto, we, we just brought together um, 720 groups um, to agree on seven things that we want political parties to do. And we floated it this as a citizens elections agenda. And they adopted it. Some wrote it down in their manifestos. The major parties actually acknowledge that in their manifestos because we brought together the, the, the big coalition of interreligious councils, um, the university to come together to say, we want you to allocate symbols to women. We want you to allocate X percentage of symbols uh, by symbols here, we mean like party tickets to, to, to young people. Um, we want an ethical leadership. So we want you to declare your assets um, before even becoming president. And whoever wins elections, this is the first 100 days actions we want to, to see in the first 100 days. We did not achieve all of them, but we achieved some. And uh, by 2023, we believe the more we sustain such effort, the more we begin to see social accountability actually deepening democracy. What we did in that election is to measure the uptake of citizens, the policy uptake of citizens. How many citizens are actually voting on ethnic lines uh, compared to those who vote on policy, on policy lines? So that's, that, that's one of the things that our research showed that through those campaigns, and I think Richard Glenister and other uh, uh, of, uh, writers have shown that uh, where you, you, you promote um, information dissemination campaigns over time, it may lead to behavior change, which really is, is, is at the heart of social accountability interventions. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, last comment here um, from Ahi, just very quickly, what is your take on the same question in literally yes or no in one one very short sentence okay um i think social accountability um supports democracy so i align my thoughts with that of andrew but what's important is that we need to improve and expand citizens engagement through inclusion because democracy is for the people and by the people and this includes um citizens being part of politics and governance uh, to demand and build accountability and social and social accountability provides that kind of support that the democratic um, that democracy needs. So I think I'll just stop there. Okay. And Maria, did you have your hand up? Yes, yes, but it was just a question for Tom because I didn't understand what he meant by international, international groups, international governments or sure what, sure uh, yeah to answer. I, su I suggest we maybe kind of pause on that for just a second because we're running up against the clock and I want to make sure we give a little bit of space to Craig Hammer and Nick Benaquista to offer some quick reflections and responses to what we've heard today and anything that you think was maybe missing from the discussion or anything that you'd like to build on or add to what the panel has put forward. Uh, maybe start with first, you. Susan? Yeah, go with you first, Nick, please. Oh, oh, or Craig, please, after you. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, um, I'll be very brief. Look, it's been really wonderful for me to hear about these excellent projects uh, going on around the world. And it is a re it's, it's very invigorating to hear the successes that you've had, particularly in an environment in which our conversations about democracy tend to be quite dispiriting. So uh, I want to say, I have a lot to say, I'll try to be very brief. One thing, uh, we're on the eve of the Summit for Democracy and we haven't in this conversation made the link quite yet with social, you know, with, with the rhetoric that we see there. 
so let me say one thing on that. Uh, democracy promotion, the world of democracy is often divided between rhetoric and practice. So I think a lot of the work that you guys do is actually very linked to democracy promotion. The National Endowment for Democracy used to, you know, hosted Maria as a fellow uh, not too long ago. And uh, many of your projects, I think, would make great candidates for funding from the National Endowment for Democracy, Open Society Foundation, and many of the, the donors who populate the democracy promotion world. Now, the question is, do you want to engage in the rhetoric of democracy promotion? And those two things aren't always the same. You know, and you look at what we're gonna, how we're gonna be discussing democracy at the summit for democracy, how they will be discussing it, I should say, not we. And you know, it's defending against authoritarianism. Uh, it's corruption, but it's not the kind of corruption you're talking about. We're talking about kleptocracy, you know, high level uh, collusion between oligarchs and politicians to rig the system, to, to stay in power and get rich and, and human rights. Um, and with regard to defending against authoritarianism, I think, you know, if you, if you understand democracy in that kind of Huntington-esque clash of cultures, you know, what are we doing to preserve it against the baddies in the world? You know, you have a choice as to whether to engage in that or not. And you may not, you may choose not to, I get that. That is a good choice for some. But I think it, there is some potential to look among the projects that you guys have and the movements and to ask questions about whether citizens being engaged in these kinds of activities uh, inoculates them against disinformation, polarization and misinformation, and the vulnerabilities that we see being exploited by populists and authoritarians. You know, it, it, have you built some resilience? And I think that term resilience, you know, is creeping into the conversation, um, but the notion of social accountability you know, doesn't really feature much in our kind of high level discussions about democracy, but you could insert yourselves. Alternatively, you could try to paint a different picture. There's this very frequently kind of dark, you know, we have to respond to the dangers and fears of approaching authoritarianism. And you guys can maybe tell a different story about, well, there's still a lot to build upon. Democracy isn't dead yet. It's still alive and well. Those are two ways you might engage in this debate. And from my perspective, it would be welcome to have those kinds of voices featured more prominently. I'm always happy to help people to articulate those kinds of arguments and um, uh, visions. Um, secondly, uh, media and uh, social accountability and media. I focus on media development. And I, I just wanna say a couple of quick words about Contra Corriente, which is a, a wonderful news outlet that just received a democracy award based in Honduras. Uh, and for me, it illustrates actually this great point about the possibilities for linking social accountability to political accountability and how I think we need to have more of a conversation about media and the work that you do with social movements and grassroots citizen action. Um, Contra Corriente was born of the Indignados movement, a journalist covering the Indignados movement, a movement against everyday forms of corruption, met with an activist who was frustrated that they weren't, the story wasn't being told effectively. And also seeing a flood on social media of complaints about corruption in people's daily lives, but not really being able to make sense of that flood of information or verify it and giving uh, a kind of ammunition to the corrupt because these accusations were not always verified and they didn't have the, the, the journalistic procedures to ensure that the accusations were accurate and they lost some opportunities. And so Contra Corriente was born between one, an activist and a journalist. They formed this great outlet. They were a huge part of the Pandora Papers, but they also are a platform where they help young activists to be, to be more articulate voices uh, about the challenges facing Honduras. And on the flip side of things, you know, they've, they've brought, they've brokered together these two communities who really need each other. And the journalists need the activists as well. In, in talking about accountability, impunity in the killings of journalists in Honduras is terrible. They've created a, a special prosecutor's office in Honduras, but it's the police who are supposed to be uh, investigating these abuses. These are the same people who are perpetrating, in some cases, violence against the journalists. And it's laughable. It's not, it's, this is never going to have an effect on impunity the way it's structured. 
And it strikes me that in media development, when we're struggling with these account political accountability for our journalists, there's a lot to be learned from you and from the communities that you work with about marshalling these grand coalitions uh, to bring real and meaningful accountability to these kinds of problems. And so I think there's a, we can help each other. Uh, the media community and civil society can be strange bedfellows at times, but there's a lot of common cause. And uh, I would love to carry on that conversation with you guys. And I'm sorry if I exceeded my five minutes, but it's been a provocative and uh, fun conversation. Thanks, Susan. Oh, thank you very much, Nick. And very, from my perspective, also very well received. I also come from the media development world and the conversations that we're having in this discussion, um, joining these up perhaps in a future event with the Global Forum for Media Development and SEMA would be really interesting and I think quite helpful. Um, but without further ado, over to you, Craig, for your responses and reactions and you know any key takeaways for you. Yeah, hi, Susan, thanks. Um, and so I'm, I think just very, very quickly, um, two, two, two main points. First, I should probably say, I'm sorry that I'm not Jeff Tindwa, uh, who should be here. Um, and I am uh, absolutely the poor cousin. So that out of the way, Jeff is the program manager for the Global Partnership for Sustainable, for, for, for Social Accountability, uh, which uh, Andrew had, had mentioned before the GPSA. I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, I mean, just to quickly maybe zoom out. Uh, I mean, I think the good news here, I mean, in addition to what we've heard today, which I think is extremely heartening, you know, examples of the kind of work which is really becoming the delta for, for this, these opportunities to try to seize onto mechanisms that can promote and enable better governance, is that there is, there is broader recognition now of the role and importance of social accountability. I think if you go 15 years ago, um, the, the level of, of, of acknowledgement or understanding about what social accountability is and why it's important and how it can really help become part of you know a, a package of, of of enablers for better decision making better governance more responsive to public service delivery and more it wasn't quite where, where it is today and i think that's a good sign i think the fact that you have for like 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 the the forum is coming tomorrow and you have uh, initiatives and organizations like the ogp tai the work that you're doing is a massive step in the right direction, and it, and it is something. It's cause, I think, for celebration um, and enthusiasm that this is this is something which is which is more than uh, an ad hoc phenomenon, or more than more than um, you know uh, just just talking points. Um, I think uh, that you know the challenge is, is is what we're talking about. How do you toe the line between um, you know hyper local engagement, customization on the basis of context, uh, the political economy considerations? And scale. I mean, if you're looking to really mainstream this in larger governance transformation processes, there have to be mechanisms that enable that. Um, and and there, that's the fine line to toe. Uh, and it's one I think that still needs some work. I think this is what Andrew was and he were talking about. What Naomi touched on was really getting to what the political economy considerations of effective social accountability look like from context to context, and then how you can really parse lessons from that and then turn that into something which is more systemic in terms of engagement. Um, and the challenge there is, is what would really help, and I think is still something which is coming together, is a stronger set of like an empirical foundation. I think you need a stronger empirical basis for some of this work um, because that is what, that's what moves the conversation from, um, from nice to have to must have. And I think the importance here is, is there's, a, there's still a gap there, knowledge an empirical gap that needs to be filled in order to really help facilitate this uptake um, along the lines of what I think we all really want to see. The challenge there is, you know, again, moving back 10 years ago, is the skeptics were the ones who were kind of controlling the dialogue. If you look up things like there were massive, uh, you know, publications and engagements and reports on things like does participation matter? Um, and, and there needs to be the good news, I think there's been a lot of progress since then. I mean, Carmen Milena wrote a great book a couple of years ago from political won't to political will. There's a lot more also understanding about where this work is coming in. The fact that we've got John Gaventa on this call uh, at all, I think signals that there's a lot of really, a lot of enthusiasm for this. Um, and, but obviously I think there needs to be, there needs to be a bit more here um, because as much as it is important through things like the GPSA and other initiatives, it has yet to reach that level of being a normative component of governance transformations that, that I think for those of us on this call would agree it clearly needs to be, um, but it's just not there yet. Um, I, I don't wanna go much, much beyond that. I do wanna make one plug though. The GPSA has an open window for grants 
right now. It closes next week. So for those of you interested in potential support or collaboration under the auspices of the Global Partnership for Sustainable, for, sorry, for Social Accountability, um, please, please have a look uh, at the GPSA website and, and, and make the most of the resources that are, that are, that are made available. There. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, before closing, just wanted to give the floor to anyone on the line. Um, I don't know, Denise or Blair, you've put in some really nice comments. Do you want to just say a few words and put out your suggestions or your comments? Um, no, I think I think Ehi has, has talked very well on behalf of the Accountability Lab. Thank you, everyone, for really really interesting discussion. I did pop a link in the chat to a recent report um, that might be might be useful. Um, I suppose my my closing question would would be, what's the future of, of social accountability? I don't know if we have time to get to it, but what do our panelists think are the next the next steps? What is the next phase? What are the tools that that they think will will be the right kinds of social accountability tools going forward? Citizen assemblies, for example, are all the rage at the moment. Is that an answer, or are there other things that that they see uh, emerging at this point? Love it. That's a great question to end on. Quick round uh, robin of responses, starting perhaps with Naomi and going forward. What is the future of social accountability? I think uh, moving from projects into movements. And I think we also have to have a follow-up conversation with people about this. And I wanted to hear more from quite a few people on this in this uh, webinar that we haven't had time to hear from. Uh, uh, Denise, Florencia, John Gaventa, Tom, Fred Lyon, Fr Friday. You know, there's a lot of people here I wanna hear more from. So we must have a follow-up Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, we, Naomi and I and, and others are very keen to keep this going and kind of revive the conversation a bit and join up some groups that should be in this conversation, but maybe are not always part of this discussion. So we're very hopeful to, to continue on in some way, shape or form. And um, I, we're in, we have all of your emails so we can be in touch with you. Um, but great suggestion on moving from project, moving project, moving from projects to social movements. Um, Andrew Lavalli, what's the future of social accountability? Yes, I think I agree that we have to move from projects to movements, um, but we have to start again with understanding where every nation is at in building democracy. We are all at different levels. Uh -huh. So uh, understanding high intensity democracy and low intensity democracy, uh, I think those those uh, varying points have to be acknowledged. Um, I remember when the bridge was broken, we had a broken bridge right in the middle of Freetown and the Chinese said they're going to fix it. Um, maybe Western donors will say well, we need three quotes, three quotations before it's fixed. So it's it, and governments normally jump at such opportunities. So it's important to see how, how are democracies also responding to building democracies in weak states. Wonderful way to end this, definitely. Christian, what's the future of social accountability from uh, your perspective? Yeah, I don't think I have much to add, to be frank. I think uh, from uh, project to movement kind of said it all. And frankly, uh, if, if, if that can happen, I think we, we are limited as uh, practitioners uh, in the confines of projects and we're trying to get out of those confines and it's just really, really hard. Uh, but I think we can do a better job. Wonderful, thank you. Ahi, any thoughts here on, from your perspective, what would you like to see? What's the future of social accountability for you? Um, I think one key thing would be um, investing significantly and financially in political engagement and also um, providing concrete opportunities for young people to engage in the political process and true lowering of barriers to entries, especially within the context of Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. And Maria, 
to wrap things up, what is the future of social accountability? It's such a big question. I, I don't have an answer, but maybe pieces of it. Yes, I think one uh, at least issue to include in the debate when we discuss this is the issue of the protection of, of champions, whether it's journalists or whatever. And there are many organizations that are working in that and very, very successfully. We work with many of them towards El Salvador. And there's many, I think if we can broaden that so that we can all do part of what they're already doing, I think we would be in, in a better shape at least in protecting the people that are doing something for their context. And then the, another thing, maybe a bit uh, too philosophical at this point, uh, but to discuss maybe further is uh, sort of the, the, the sense um, of how can we give these future movements, today projects, tomorrow movements, the sense of, of permanency, the, the sense that they're not intermittent, that they will continue in some shape or form, and that uh, and that in itself is a is, is a definition, is an advocacy tool for um, in, the, in, in the issue that we work for the governments, for example. So so just that to to build uh, the idea that these um, fort effort and muscles are here to stay. Thank you, Maria. And thank you to everyone who's joined us on the line and to our panelists and respondents, Craig and Nick. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion and I know very quick on very intense and deep issues. Um, we do plan on taking it forward. Um, if, if you all have ideas, it sounds like there's a lot coming from the chat and um, Naomi, your initial suggestion, moving from moving from projects to movements um, sounds like it's the makings of a new conference or a workshop that we could perhaps um, think about doing in the next year. Um, we will be uh, in short course writing up our 200 word summary and our recommendations, which we'll share with the organizers of the Global Democracy Coalition. So uh, look for those. Um, and without further ado, um, we will end today's webinar on social accountability. Um, thank you, Naomi, for doing this with me and being such a wonderful co-convener. Thank you, everyone. It's been great. Please send us some emails. Thank oh, you. Wait. Shifting power. Well done, John. Thank you for getting that in there. <laughs> Please be in touch. Send us an email, everyone, if you have any last minute thoughts before this evening, because we have to send this 200 words tonight. So any last thoughts, anyone didn't feel you had an, enough time, please send us an email. Thank you, putting my email in here. Thank you, bye-bye. Um, bye, bye, Andrew, bye, Maria. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye, bye. everyone. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. Naomi, do you want to stay on or should I call you? Yes, this is good. Stay on. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>